What's up guys? Welcome to Frozen Electronics. I am sorry that I haven't been updating lately, but between uh, writing for Element 14 and the other announcement I'm about to make, I have been exceedingly busy. It's been kind of crazy. Um, when I was in my teens, I think I was probably about 15. For, uh, probably 15, maybe 16. A really good friend of mine in high school um, whose family had a lot more money than mine, although that's only part of the story, uh, he was interested in a lot of things and because his parents had money, as long as he, you know, they would buy things for him as long as it was educational or, you know, they wouldn't just hand him money and he could do whatever he wanted. If he was like, oh, I'm really interested in this and blah, 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 and, you know, it was an actual good reason, they would usually buy things for him. Which is, I think, a, you know, it was amazing. It was actually just him and his mom. Um, and his mom's boyfriend. Anyway, <clears throat> they had a really good system, and I don't usually talk about political or social things, but uh, when it comes to parenting, I mean, they just had an amazing system. She just, she trusted him, uh, and uh, she had brought him up to make good decisions about things like that, how to spend money wisely, how to get the best value for money, um, to spend money on things you're interested in, to always, you know, buy the essentials and pay your rent and stuff, but always have money left over for the fun things in life and stuff you're interested in. And uh, that really stuck with him, I think, through his life. But anyway, the point of the story, at one point, he was really interested in radio. And he thought it was so cool that you could tune in. Uh, he never got his license. He only ever listened to radio. But uh, he really thought it was really cool. Single sideband, AM, you could listen to stuff. He would get signals from all over the world. Because uh, probably one of the biggest purchases his mom ever made for him. She bought him this Grundig radio, which retailed at the time for almost $2,000 Canadian. Uh, it was just an absolute beautiful receiver. Uh, it could, I mean, it could receive almost every band you can think of. Uh, it could do the airport bands, which was very cool. Of course, it had uh, single sideband amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, uh, the airport bands, uh, I can't even remember all of them, the weather bands. Um, there was this big screen on it. At the time, of course, TFT and LCD flat screens weren't really that common, so it was just... Uh, a liquid crystal display, but it was very big, there was a lot of information on it. The the antenna on the thing was gigantic. It collapsed down into a small little antenna, but you could just keep pulling it out. It was, I'm not even kidding, it was probably about four meters long. Like, the thing was ginormous. You could literally just, the base of it was really thick, of course, because it was so much weight. But with this huge antenna, uh, you actually got really good reception. Um, so the point of the story was, he would lose interest in things, um, but unlike a lot of kids or teenagers where they would just put something in a closet and, you know, spoiled kids that, you know, they're interested in something for a week, he was by no means spoiled. He learned everything he wanted to learn about it. Um, he, you know, opened up the radio, uh, you know, did tons of reading. He did all sorts of reading. So he learned, I think, pretty much everything he wanted to learn about it. And... I was over at his place one day, fiddling around with it. Um, I was like, oh man, this is so cool. I've always been interested in radio. He's like, oh, take it. And I looked, at, I was like, like I was pretty much speechless. I'm like, because I knew Grundig, I knew that brand. I knew how expensive they were. I'm like, I thought he was joking. I was like, yeah, right. He's like, no, seriously, if you're interested in it, take it. It's yours. He's like, I'm, I've learned everything I wanted to learn with it and um, take it. And so I told him, well, I'll borrow it, you know, but I don't really want to take it. Uh, but it ended up belonging to me uh, in the long run. And I took it back to my place and set up. And when my dad saw it, he he just, he was like, where the hell did that come from? That's a really expensive radio. I explained, my friend gave it to me, essentially. Like, uh, I'm probably going to give it back to him. Long story short, I ended up, it's a really long, complex story. But that radio is no longer in my possession, which really sucks. Um, but that time in my life really sparked my interest in radio. Now, around that time, I used to be a, a, definitely a software geek. I was into computers, uh, in building computers, programming. I took programming and uh, communications all through high school, so I was into video editing, programming, software, all that sort of stuff. 
The electronics came a little bit later. I was always interested in electronics, but I didn't get into it much until after high school. And now, of course, it's what I do. Uh, but that radio has always been sort of niggling in the back of my head. Uh, it is so very cool. Uh, I don't know, I really, I've always been fascinated with radio and the fact you can just throw, throw an antenna up and talk to people in Japan or South Africa or Europe or, of course, in Canada here, all over the United States and Canada. So, I've been studying for my amateur radio license, which I am going to get probably in the next, uh, hopefully in the next week at the very latest. I want to do it as soon as possible because I've been studying and I always find it's good to write tests, you know, while everything's fresh in your mind and you've been studying and you've been focusing on it. I've been, uh, the way it works in Canada, the test is 100 multiple choice questions. In the US it's only 35. 35 multiple choice questions to get someone on the air? I mean, I know they're trying to get more young people into it, and I guess that's the reason why, but 35 questions is not much. 100 questions isn't even that much. I can do the test in under half an hour um, because I've studied. I guess, you know, some people don't go as fast as I do, but... Um, so, in Canada, you have to get at least 70%. So you have to get at least 70 questions right. And if you get 70 right, you get a basic license, which means you're allowed to broadcast on a transmit, I should say, on the two meter band, um, I think that's pretty much it. I think the two meter band, maybe a couple other bands, but a lot of the high frequency, or a lot of the lower frequency stuff actually, pardon me, because that actually is quite high frequency. The high frequency, of course, doesn't propagate as far, which is why the beginners are on that band, because, you know, it's usually local, maybe somewhere in your province. I mean, you can get up to, I think, I can't remember, couple hundred kilometers with the two meter band but of course it's not very good you know the 20 meter and the 40 meter band uh, are you know excellent for propagation around the world when the ionosphere and you know the tropospheric ducting all that stuff happens you can actually get your radio signal to go quite far and that's the amazing thing with uh, amateur radio what they call DXing or long distance radio so uh, in order to have the um, ability to broadcast on the lower frequency, so the 40 meter, 60, uh, you know, 40, 20 meter, uh, 80 meter, 75 meter, 160 meter, all that, you have to get your honors on your basic, or you can get your basic without honors and then do your advanced. They've split it up this way on purpose, so I'm going to probably get my basic with honors, and then I'm also going to get my advanced. Because not only does the advanced let you use the whole band if you didn't get honors, but it also allows you to build and maintain your own radio equipment, which of course, as an electronics hobbyist, is what I really want to do. But, of course, I'm going to take it in steps. I'm going to try and get honors on my basic test, and then, you know, I'm going to get on the air, get a radio, hopefully, um, then I'll go for my advanced. Uh, of course, I have a lot going on, but I just wanted to say that, that I'm going to be an amateur radio operator. Oh, it just would not be an episode without me yawning once. I am so terribly sorry. I apologize. I'm sure there's people who watch that. It just drives them insane. Believe me, it bothers me as well. I try and do everything in one shot now because even though I can edit, um, I found it's much easier. I uh, am more motivated to just film it and then just throw it up on YouTube as one shot. So much simpler because um, I don't have a whole lot of time for editing right now. So what else have I been doing? I... Um, I'm allowed to say, I'm pretty sure, that, well, <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway, I have now signed a non-disclosure agreement with Element 14, which means that I'm going to get to work on some really cool stuff that I can't tell anyone about, and of course I'm not going to break that NDA, so I'm not going to be able to tell you guys, unfortunately. After something, you know, uh, later on, after things change, I might be able to talk about it, um, but of course, up until that point, there's nothing I can say. So that's part of that. I've also been working on my project for uh, April. I am so sorry. I guess technically my March project, because I'm working on it through March. It's going to be published April 1st. So I've been doing some of the code for that. Um, this one I'm going to have a bit of a budget for. I have to buy a few things. That's actually what I was doing when I thought, hey, why not turn on the camera? Uh, I just wanted to give you guys an update because I feel bad I haven't said much in a while. So, yeah, I've been working on that, working really hard on my amateur radio. 
Um, unfortunately, I haven't been soldering as much, but something I have been soldering here, we can take a quick look at. I literally just got this working, finally. My constant current dummy load. The problem before, um, I might have shown this before, there was two, I was using two separate op amps. They were, I can't see, LM741s, I believe. Now I've got an LM324, which is what Dave used in his original design. And I think that that is probably part of the key. Because now that I've done that, um, it seems to be working really well all of a sudden. Not really well, it's not perfect by any means, but it's definitely allowing me to actually tune the amount of current. Whereas before, I could only tune it in a very small, narrow little band. But now I can tune it if I'm if I have a five volt power supply hooked up, I can tune it all the way down to 90 milliamps, and then all the way up to almost 600 milliamps. So I'm able to tune it a lot more precisely than I was before. Of course, I should be able to turn it all the way down to zero, and all the way almost up at least to an amp because the resistor divider. Uh, Theoretically, you should be able to get, you know, at least an amp and a half. Of course, I'm still seeing some oscillations. You can see this is my feedback path here. Uh, there, there's the bottom of the MOSFET. So that's the gate driving there. Um, then, of course, the drain comes from the power supply. The source goes both into this huge 25 watt 1 ohm resistor and also as part of the negative feedback. Um, I'm going to put some resistance in here, although in Dave's original drawing, he doesn't show any resistance in either of those two black wire paths. But that's what I've been told. You just, you really have to just play around with it. You know, try different resistances, try resistance across them sometimes. Uh, some, sometimes you might even need to put a little capacitance in there. You just, you really need to play around. Another big thing, I think I did this on my old ones too, but this time it makes a huge difference. Whoops. As you can see, there's a cap directly across the power supply for the LM324. Um, that's what's great about these little surface mount caps when you're uh, prototyping. You can just stick them right in between their uh, underside of a dip. Um, yeah, there's a couple little tricks like that I use quite often. I won't go into the whole thing. This little board that's attached to is just a split supply. And that's about it. So, anyway, thanks for watching guys. I hope you uh, keep tuning in. I am going to try and do more updates. Once I have my ham radio license and I'm broadcasting, I'm gonna do some uh, videos. I'm gonna videotape my very first QSO. Um, which will be quite cool for you non-amateur radios. A QSO is a contact. There's all these Q codes you have to memorize. You know, QTH is your location. Um, QRY is change frequency. Uh, oh, what are the other ones? Uh, QRM is I am being interfered with. QRN, as in November, is I am being troubled by static. I mean, there's all these codes, of course, stemming back from the war. Um, because everything was done with Morse code, which is what another thing I'm trying to learn. There's actually a separate qualification for Morse code as well. Um, and that gives you a couple more uh, privileges. You can, of course, broadcast in the Morse code band. Um, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, again, thanks for watching. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And don't forget to subscribe and share. Uh, it really helps a lot. And uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully we will see you again soon.